Welcome. I'm doing this for the second time now. So I've learned something and I'm gonna introduce myself first. My name is Elena Simperl. I'm a professor of computer science at King's College in London in the UK. Um, I was also one of the program chairs of this year's conference. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our final keynote of 2022. Um, it's Jamie Teven of Microsoft, Chief Scientist and Technical Fellow. Um, she leads Microsoft's Future of Work initiative. Um, and I hope you agree with me. Uh, the way we have been working in the last two years has changed a lot. And um, Jamie is leading this cross-business initiative at Microsoft with LinkedIn and GitHub to study how the pandemic has changed the way people work. And before that, she um, was technical advisor of the Microsoft CEO and led the productivity team and received numerous awards and accolades for, for, for her work. Um, completed a PhD at MIT and um, a bachelor from, from, from Yale and is affiliate faculty at Washington. Jamie, personally, I'm a big fan from the Haystack days. <laughs> I'm a semantic web person, but also since I've seen you last year at the Human um, Computation and Crowdsourcing Conference, where I think you delivered the best keynote I have seen um, in recent years, where you've actually shown us papers, <laughs> the paper that you were talking about on screen um, rather than slides. Um, I was um, absolutely blown away and I'm very much looking forward to your uh, talk today. So also personally from me, welcome. And we're so happy to have you. Thank you, Elena. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm actually gonna build on some of that content from HCOMP too, to think about uh, how changing work practices and in particular, the, um, the changes we're going through. So two years ago, we did a rapid shift to remote work. And now as workplaces are starting to open up, we're also starting to figure out uh, in-person work. And I don't like presenting remotely with slides because it's really nice to be able to see people's faces. I feel like we get, we get little enough human to human interaction as it is. So I am just going to, um, to talk and share a little bit about some of the things um, on my mind, highlighting some of the things that, that Elena and some of you uh, may have heard before and bringing in some new data and new, and new facts. And, um, you know, really thinking about the role that the web conference community plays in, in emerging work practices. Because I would say as technologists, as computing researchers, it's really our responsibility to be thinking about emerging work practices. And we are in the middle of the most significant change to work practices that probably any of us will see in our lifetime. And for the past several millennia, space has been the primary technology that we've used to get things done. Uh, in the coming hybrid work era, Instead, it's gonna be things like web technology and people's ability to work together online that are gonna shape the way that we do things. And so prior to the pandemic, we were pretty much already in the middle of a really big shift in how technology and work interact with the move to the cloud and the proliferation of edge devices and real advances in artificial intelligence. But COVID, has created this phase change. And it's taken all of this innovation, all of this primordial goo that was sort of sitting around waiting for something to happen. And it provided the spark that enabled us all to look at work uh, with, fresh practice, with fresh eyes. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about the, the shift that the web actually helped kick off several de decades ago. And then I'm gonna talk about that phase change that happened as a result of COVID forcing anyone who could possibly work uh, remotely to actually work remotely. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm sharing this as a call to action. Uh, you know, because given the centrality and the importance of the web in this transition, this transition that's been happening for decades, it's this community's responsibility to lean in and actively and intentionally create a new and better future of work. Because there's a lot of risk and a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty ahead of us. 
Um, so let's start by uh, looking at this technological shift that was underway prior to COVID in good part because of the web. Um, and I'd like you to start off by thinking about the first time that you encountered the web. And this may already be on your mind if you attended one of those sessions earlier in the day on the history of the web. And I suspect that different people in this audience will give very different answers, um, you know, because some of you created the web. <laughs> and, uh, and if you're under 30, you probably don't actually even remember a world without the web. Um, but I certainly do. I, I, I'm in between there. I neither created the web nor don't, uh, re don't remember a world without it. Um, I remember the first time I saw it, it was back in 1994, which is actually the same year as the very first uh, WWW conference. And I remember being in this dungeon of a computer lab at my undergraduate institution. And this guy called me over and he's like, Jamie, come over here. And he showed me the very first web page that I ever saw through the Lynx browser. And if you recall the Lynx browser, it was entirely text-based and you had to tab around between the links and you had to click return if you wanted to follow one. And I didn't really get the point of it. I thought it was pretty dumb. Um, uh, you know, the guy was awesome. I ended up marrying him. We have four kids, but the web didn't make any sense to me. And I don't think that I was completely off base about that. It really wasn't that useful at that point. In 1994, there were maybe 25,000 websites in existence. Um, there was very little of the broad range of content you see now, but it did set about changing things in some pretty important ways. You know, for one, it created this lightweight way for people to connect, um, so much so that real-time collaboration is a fundamental part of any computing experience. And post-COVID, we're only just starting to see how online collaboration changes the way that people work together. Uh, you know, it's becoming easy to gather the right people with the right expertise at the right time. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because this rapid shift to remote work that we've seen these past two years has really accelerated progress on that front. Um, but the other change, which I'm gonna dive into first that the web set into motion is that it made it possible to observe people's interactions with software at scale. So, you know, I was, uh, how I was thinking the web was dumb. The thing that made me stop thinking that was the emergence of web search, which was one of the first real online services that people used. The content on the web basically becomes useful once you can find it, once you know what's there. And in fact, I thought web search was so cool that while I was in college, I actually ended up taking an internship at one of the very early search engines. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. It got purchased by Disney and is now called Go. But at the time, it was called InfoSeek. And you may remember uh, InfoSeek. And that internship was kind of interesting. You know how sometimes you make a decision and it shapes the rest of your life and you have it just feels like a random arbitrary <laughs> decision and you have no idea at the time? That InfoSeek inter internship was an example of that. Um, you know, we think of search engines as these giant machines now, but at, at the time, InfoSeq was really small, maybe 50 people. And William Chang, who was the CTO, um, was really interested in research and kind of wanted to create a research organization at InfoSeq, which is hard to do in a 50-person organization. And he sat me down and he gave me the WWW proceedings, I think from 1997, 96 or 97. Um, and and my job that summer as an undergraduate was to read the dub 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 proceedings and come up with clever ways to advance web search. Um, you know, this is from somebody who didn't even under, I had no idea how web search worked. I was like, how would you go out and look at all the different web pages and search over them? Um, uh, it was, it was an amazing experience. Uh, the, I was just in preparing for this talk, looking back through, through those old proceedings. And um, you can see the emergence of a lot of things that are important to us now. Um, one of the things that I got really excited about at that point was link analysis. Um, 
at the time, search engines weren't actually uh, not search engines were new and Yahoo was the main way that people were navigating content. And it wasn't actually a search engine. The way that uh, Yahoo was set up was it was a directory, a manually curated directory. Yahoo hired a bunch of editors who created web pages for content uh, that gathered a bunch of information. So these directory pages that people created were sort of the gold standard. And if you went to, uh, for example, InfoSeq, it wasn't just a search box. It actually was a big list of links that you could follow uh, modeled on that Yahoo directory approach. And so one of the things I got excited about was using link analysis to automatically create directories. At the time, people on the web were creating all sorts of pages where they're like the world's best car pages or the best because it, it was hard to find content. And so you could go scrape those pages, look at the links um, that were coming out of them and start uh, aggregating across the different directory pages and, and uh, automatically create a director. I actually went on when I went back to um, back to school, I did my senior project on that, ended up selling it back to InfoSeq. I was wrong about the way that we should be using link analysis. Uh, Google came along a year later and showed us that that was super useful for search engines and understanding the value of information and creating real things, but it was a really exciting um, and fun thing to do. Uh, InfoSeq was also my very first experience with query logs. And um, by 1997, we were probably seeing a fair number of queries. You know, just, just a few years earlier, search engines were probably seeing, you know, tens of thousands of queries a day. By then, we were seeing on the order of a couple million queries a day. I think by the end of 1997, Alta Vista claimed that it was seeing 20 million queries. Um, a day. I remember at InfoSeq, we used to get swag every time the number of queries went up by another million. And, um, and it started happening often enough that we'd be like, oh, another coffee mug. <laughs> uh, okay. A major search engine today sees more queries in, you know, like two minutes than we would see in, a in an entire day. But at the time, we thought it was really amazing. And we thought that search was going to change the world. And, you know, looking back, I can see that while I was right about search engines being transformative, I was fundamentally wrong about why. So I was excited about creating this oracle to all the world's knowledge where you could ask any question, you can get any answers. And we've made really amazing progress on this front. But I missed that it was how this was going to happen that mattered. The way that search engines have managed to get as good as they are today is through behavioral data. So they see those queries that people enter, and they see the results that people click on, and they use that data to get better. And while this was new with search engines, it's now the way all software is built. Every product we build, it engages people, and then that engagement produces behavioral data. And then we use the data to create better products, and that in turn drives more engagement. And we're all really familiar with these feedback loops. They're driven via experimentation where we use the behavioral data to do A-B tests and compare different experiences. And more recently, we're seeing them really being driven by artificial intelligence, where we feed the behavioral data back into the system so that the system can learn from it directly. And the results have been amazing. We've been hearing papers presented about this all week. You can just see the impact. And we can also increasingly see that these, that these systems are having second order effects as well. We heard a keynote about this. We've been hearing a lot on this. So for example, engagement-driven feedback loops drive our engagement. They drive our attention. <laughs> so um, one of my favorite stats that I like to share is that people notice their phone is missing before they notice their wallet is missing. I mean, I literally, I'm sitting here my attention is completely focused on you and on talking, and I've got my phone right here. Uh, what's more, 
people notice their phone is missing before they notice their kid is missing. And that sounds ridiculous, but I'm pretty sure it would be true for me. And my four boys are really noisy. Now your phone wasn't built to capture your attention. Your phone was built to make phone calls, to connect you with people that are far away. But the applications on your phone, as they started using your data to become more and more engaging, your phone accidentally became something that you couldn't put down. And this interaction between technology and what people choose to do is really fascinating. You know, the tools that we use, they always inherently impact what we choose to do, whether we intend them to or not, whether they're designed that way or not. And it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way things are. And as long as we keep this at the fore, we have an opportunity to start building technology that impacts us positively instead of negatively. So for example, if we put people at the center of those feedback loops that are driving web applications, instead of putting engagement at the center, that allows us to start thinking about it in new ways. Like we start thinking about like, oh, how do I capture a person's goals instead of capturing their attention? And how do I start building systems that optimize for their goals? And the end result will be that we create technology that doesn't just itself get better with use as the data feeds back in, but actually also helps people get closer to their goals and helps them get better as they use it. So for example, I did my doctoral thesis on personalized search and trying to understand how people find information. And one of the things that I was really interested in is refinding and how people get back to information that they've seen before. Um, because information you've seen before, it leaves an impression on you. And so the search results that you've seen before influence what you're going to see uh, later. And uh, people repeat searches a lot. About a third of all of the queries that you run are repeat searches. And about a third of the links that you click on when you search are repeat searches. So you're seeing content all the time that you have expectations about. But, and this probably doesn't surprise you given your familiarity with the web, the search result ordering changes a lot. You know, new resources become available, other things change, and that's gonna uh, affect the ranking, it's gonna affect what, what can be shown. And when we look at the, the data, when the search result ordering shifts, it slows a person who's trying to refine something down. And that happens even if we do something like take a search result that was at the bottom of the search result list and move it to the top because we know it's what you're looking for, you're still gonna be slower finding it because it's not where you expect it to be. And actually this is well known in the uh, HCI literature, things like dynamic menus, super challenging because you build muscle memory, you build expectations about where menu items are gonna be. So if we start shifting those around, you get confused. Even though the system is performing theoretically better, because, it, because of the impact that system has had on you in the past, because of the way it's made you expect the world to be, you're gonna perform differently. And we see these sorts of interactions and these influences show up in social search contexts as well. Uh, one of the systems that I find really interesting is something that I built with uh, Mary Morris and Brent Hecht a number of years thinking about the questions that people ask online, the stuff you can't find via search engines, but ask other people. So we created a chat bot called Search Buddies that would identify people who are asking questions on social media and auto-generate an answer for them with the goal of helping all the unanswered questions get answered. And one of the things that we saw when we started looking at people's interactions with Search Buddies is that search buddies didn't just help by providing new information. The questions they, that search buddy answered actually drove other people to answer those questions. And what's more is the kinds of content that search buddies offered influenced the kinds of content that other people provided as well. So if search buddy said, oh, here's a great link to something that you might find interesting, other people might respond with links as well. And if search buddy said, oh, hey, you should chat with Elena about this, you might find it interesting. You might find her, she has a good answer. 
then other people might suggest people to connect with as well. And so what we saw was Search Buddies wasn't just helping people find the answers to their questions through the knowledge it provides, it was helping them find answers through the influence it was exerting on other people. And it's really cool to start thinking about how you use that in intentional ways. So, you know, we talked about engagement-based systems and they encourage engagement, but engagement's just one goal. Uh, what if you give an AI system a different goal? Like something a person actually wants to accomplish. And as an example of this, Long Chi Yang who's on my team here at Microsoft. He did his uh, graduate, graduate work on this topic. Um, he studies recommender systems. Um, and he looked at, for example, how you might account for a person's nutritional goals when recommending a recipe to them as much as their sort of what they are, what they're looking for, what kinds of recipes they would actually engage with. Um, so if you're searching for a recipe, a recommender system wants to give you a recipe that you'll like. And obviously we all love fat and sugar and salt. <laughs> And so the system's going to recommend things like fried chicken and chocolate cake. But our goal is typically not to eat all fried chicken and chocolate cake. We like to eat food that tastes good. Uh, but we also often want to eat more vegetables or we want to eat less sugar or we would like to eat low carb. And one of the things that Long Chi found was that he could tune the algorithm to give people recipe recommendations that met their nutritional goals without sacrificing how much they like the restaurant, the recipes that they actually found. And so my point with all of this is that the ability to observe people's interactions at scale that the web has driven has been a really foundational shift. The web is responsible for applications moving to the cloud. Search engines were just the first example of that. And that then allowed us to aggregate data, enabled us to collect new types of data from anywhere through mobile devices, through new sensors like voice and other things, and then make use of that data to drive improvements in AI and through experimentation. And so that's the context we were in two years ago. I know it's hard to remember two years ago. It's actually kind of crazy. <laughs> that's the context we were in two years ago. And if you recall, there were two changes, so there's sort of this context is two things that, that, that I thought were interesting. One was the ability to see people interact with information and applications at scale. And then the other was uh, the ability to support lightweight collaboration by people who were not co-located. And I promised we'd get back to that. And um, this is sort of the stuff that's been popping up now in recent years. Um, and a lot of interesting stuff has been happening over the past couple of decades in that space as well with collaborative content creation and social media and platform mediated work. But that's really nothing compared to the shift that we saw then in uh, March, 2020. So for context, although I know many of you from my Microsoft research days, uh, as Elena mentioned, I'm currently chief scientist for Microsoft's core productivity products. And that means my job is to drive product innovation. And that's a really hard thing to do with such big successful products, despite all of the innovation we've been talking about, but it's important. You know, things like Windows and Outlook and Word, they've been around for decades and people depend on them for their most important tasks. And you have to be very thoughtful about how you change them. And so when I took this role about three years ago, Shortly after doing a stint working as technical advisor for our CEO, Satya Nadella, he asked me to take on this chief scientist role because it was becoming clear that as hard as it can be to drive change in established products, this shift that we've just been talking about was deeply important to really lean into. Research and science and experimentation and AI, these are becoming increasingly fundamental to the entire product building process. And then just as I was getting started, the pandemic hit. So I know, I, I know March 2020 is a is a is a memorable 
time for all of us. It seared into all of our minds and it was terrifying in many ways. Um, one of the things that for me was particularly scary at that moment was whether this new made up role that I had just moved into would continue to exist. Um, because, you know, big disruptions like the one brought about COVID by COVID tend to be a time when many companies look to drive efficiencies. And it's not unusual for something like research to just be seen as nice to have. So I was worried that there wouldn't be a need for this new job that I was in the process of making up. Um, that being said, COVID actually ended up making my job easier because another way that companies deal with disruption is through innovation. And Microsoft has really doubled down on research and innovation this past two years. In the um, 15 years-ish that I've been a researcher here at Microsoft, I really haven't seen such hunger to get research into our products and into the hands of our customers uh, quickly. And honestly, that's because nobody knows what's happening with work right now. I've been studying it for the past two years and I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, not, you know, I'm gonna share some, some insights, but that doesn't mean that I know. We're in the middle of the most significant change to work practices that we're ever gonna see. And if you're a productivity company like Microsoft, figuring out what that means matters a whole lot. We're trying really hard. We have a lot of levers in place that we use to explore it from telemetry data to customer panels, to survey instruments, to studies of our own employees. We run brain scans using EEG. We do all sorts of ways to look at it. And in March, 2020, when COVID hit and all of us became overnight unwitting participants in this giant, uncontrolled natural experiment into remote work. Any researcher at Microsoft doing anything came together and started using all of these different levers and created what we believe is the world's largest research effort in post-COVID work practices. You can find the research that we've published there to kind of follow up on some of the things that I'm, I'm going to mention shortly at aka.ms slash nfw. nfw stands for new future work. So aka.ms slash nfw. And I will tell you a secret, which is on Monday, <laughs> we're uh, releasing a very large research compilation that you will want to check out. Um, last spring, one year into the pandemic, we released a big research report on what we knew to date uh, about remote work from that shift. We're now re uh, releasing basically the second edition of that on Monday. And it's going to um, have a whole lot of new findings from, from another year of remote work and actually include some additional explorations into what hybrid work is starting to look at. And it also covers a lot of the really interesting technological innovations that have happened because a year ago, we were still just figuring out what, what's going on this past year. Like we've all leaned into remote work and started to figure out um, some of the good things, so much so that people are having a hard time returning back to the office <laughs> now as things open up. Um, and you know, given all this research that we've done, people often ask me what's the biggest surprise that we've seen. And that changes over time and, it, and it's hard to, to remember fully. But I do remember the very first surprise that we saw in the data was that people were actually showing up as still productive while remote. And at this point, that seems obvious. <laughs> But two years ago, that was a real surprise. People didn't think that we'd be able to shift to remote work. It's kind of, it's, 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 it's been, um, you know, this is a real change. And information work, information work and measuring producti the productivity of information work, that's hard to define and measure. Um, you can get an initial picture of that using some simple short-term metrics. Probably the gold standard in the literature is to use self-report data. We also sometimes use activity metrics, uh, things that you can observe through telemetry data. And uh, regardless of what sort of simple measure you're going to be using, uh, when you look from pre-March 2020 to post-March 2020, you see that productivity roughly stayed stable. Um, I think product, uh, developer productivity is a really interesting thing to look at within that bucket because at, at least at Microsoft, we have a ton of developer data, both because we have a large internal developer population and through our products like Visual Studio 
and uh, GitHub. And developer productivity is also kind of interesting because a lot of the work that they do is measurable. Um, historically, looking at things like lines of code is a terrible way to measure develop, developer productivity. It tends to encourage really bad behavior, bloated code. Um, but a common developer activity metric is the pull request. And a pull request is a mechanism for developers to notify uh, team members and others that they've completed a feature. And across all of the studies that we've run, when we look at it, the number and velocity of the pull requests uh, increased a little bit, while their size remained roughly consistent. And you can, of course, look at other kinds of information worker activity as well. You can think of meetings and emails as the pull requests of information work. And worldwide, all of our telemetry also shows that this data either remained consistent or uh, trended up the average time people were spending in meetings more than doubled. People started sending billions more emails each month. Uh, basically, you know, some of this comes from the fact that the transition to remote work forced a lot of our behavior to become digitally mediated. So pretty much every meeting that we sat in started to involve a computer. Every conversation we had was recorded and transcribed. We can't talk without a screen between our places, between our faces. We don't have a presentation that's not mediated by a computer. Um, and you know, all of this is going up. And the data shows like, and, and like this is happening for two reasons. Because we anybody who lived through that period knows. That, there, that, that, that that wasn't necessarily a good thing. That's not like, oh, hey, we're staying productive. <laughs> that was like, oh, hey, we're working a lot. And I'm working longer, you know, and you see people working early in the morning, you see them working on that in the evenings, you see them working on the weekends. Um, and I, I just remember how hard that was. I mean, I, mean, I remember the, not knowing how to take breaks between meetings. I would spend whole days where I'm like, when do I get to go to the bathroom? When do I get to get a glass of water? I would fall into bed at the end of the day and be like, oh, I don't know how to end a meeting if somebody's not knocking at the door because they want the conference room. Um, and we, and, you know, we started to figure those things out. And, and so, so there was some of the, some of the productivity that happened there came from that. Uh, but, but it also, some of it was actual people maintaining productivity. So developer, uh, the developer increase that we saw, for example, had two sources. We saw more pull requests per hour, and we uh, also saw people working more hours. So the more hours is people working longer times, more pull requests by, per hour means they're actually able to focus and able to get things done. Um, but all in all, this obviously had a huge impact on well-being, and that's something that's been a major focus over the past couple of years, uh, both in terms of the software that we build at Microsoft and in terms of how business decision makers are thinking about it and how individuals are thinking about their own work and how they want to do this. Uh, how, how they think, how they want to value the work that they do. Um, but of particular interest to this group, I actually want to talk a little bit about collaboration because I think that's where we saw the biggest changes in COVID. Um, you know, working from home is well suited to personal work, to um, to getting your own things done. Uh, it put, takes a bigger toll on how we get things done with others. So Sonia Jaffe and Sitsuri Longchi, who I mentioned earlier, and a bunch of us. Uh, ran a study that was published in Nature Human Behavior to look at how collaboration patterns have changed following COVID. And that study compared the anonymized collaboration patterns of two different groups of Microsoft employees, one group that had worked remotely prior to the pandemic, and one group that transitioned to work uh, remotely during the pandemic. So it was a total of tens of thousands of people, over 60,000 people, um, and with these two groups, what we were able to do is because the collaboration activity of the two groups moved in parallel prior to the pandemic, we could use causal analysis to um, take out, subtract out any of the differences in behavior between the two groups and isolate the effects of remote work from the effects of the uh, pandemic. And so then we looked at that data and we said, okay, how did that impact? How did the move to remote work impact when people were communicating, how they communicated, who they communicated with, um, and learn about how those collaboration patterns are changing. One of the things that I really thought was interesting was um, that there was a pretty significant shift from synchronous collaboration to asynchronous collaboration. When I look back and remember that experience 
of spring 2020, I remember feeling like there were meetings all the time. But, um, but and, and while that was true, when you actually do this causal analysis and subtract out the impact of the pandemic, we actually see that remote work caused a 5% decrease in synchronous meetings. Instead, it was driving more email and more IM messages. And one of the things that I remember as we were starting to see this, this data emerge is I was talking a lot about asynchronous and synchronous collaboration and people are like, Jamie, you're such a nerd. <laughs> you have to stop using the word asynchronous all the time. People don't know what that means. And then my kids came home and started talking, you know, because they were started working from home and they started talking about their homework as asynchronous schoolwork. So clearly the concept is so important that we've, we've, we've all learned how to talk about that. Um, another really interesting thing that this nature human behavior study showed is um, that while firm-wide remote work increased intra-group connections, you know, these are our, our strong ties, the people we work with a lot, the share of time that people spend with their cross-group connections or their weak ties, the people that they, in other orgs, the people they don't see as often, that dropped by about uh, 25%. Teams essentially were adapting to do more loosely coupled work while remote. They were working in these tight groups with fewer dependencies across groups. Basically, we were sort of spending down that social capital with the other, with, with our broad network and focusing on our, on our closed network. And we were able to do this uh, because of the tools that were, and we were able to see that because of the massive digital transformation that was brought about by remote work. And all of these interactions we were able to see, all the new types of work we were able to see, the new behavioral traces we could see we're new. And this really reminds me of that transition that we saw with the move online with the web to, to web-based applications. But it's just, it's just expanding the kinds of things we see. Every meeting is digital. Everything has a transcript. We saw meeting recordings, for example, more than double between March 2020 and February 2022. I mean, and that's because meetings too, more than, you know, we had water cooler conversations are now digitally mediated. And so this slow multi-decade transition that we had where we're uh, capturing behavioral data and connecting people, like it hit prime time. And all of a sudden, because of that, we can start seeing the relationships between people. We can see who's talking to who, we can draw insights, we can, and then, it starts becoming really important for us to be like, ooh, we can start being really intentional about this, experimenting and making it better. And be intentional about the impact of our tools and our work environment. And what is the impact on the, of that on meeting our goals? You know, if I wanna build my weak ties because remote work has, has caused trouble with it, how can I do that? I can run an experiment, I can figure that out. And you know, the, the, the important thing to note is this isn't new impact. Our physical interactions have always impacted our weak ties and our network. The way our office spaces are designed, our company policy, all of this impacted it. We just couldn't measure it. We couldn't understand it. And we couldn't experiment with it. And now all of a sudden we can, and it's going to be transformative. It's going to be like the same as taking the information on my desk and putting it online and getting it to web scale and seeing what amazing things that unlock. And now as we're starting to reintroduce physical space back into the equation, that's becoming, that, that's really creating new avenues to explore. So space is this really important technology that we've been using, as I mentioned earlier, for, you know, pretty much from the beginning to work together. Face-to-face -face interactions, they drive everything we do. We use space to brainstorm when we sit around a whiteboard. We use it to get exposed to new ideas when we chat with someone for a few minutes before a meeting starts. I'm missing the use of space at the web conference right now to get everybody's thoughts and reactions and hear what's top of mind. We use space to get our burning questions answered when we barge into somebody's office. Space affords collaboration. It affords spontaneous interaction. It affords serendipitous connections. Um, it also creates temporal boundaries for us. Because when we go into the office in the morning, 
that's when work starts. And when you go home in the evening, that's when work ends. And it creates boundaries between our work lives and our home lives. Because when I'm in the office, I don't have to worry. One of my kids is going to come barging in while I'm in the middle of a keynote. And they're about to leave for school any minute. So that there is a risk that that will happen. Um, space affords focus. That's part of the reason developers were able to do more pull requests per hour. Um, you would be amazed at the amount of work that companies put in creating workspaces that are productive for you. And facilities like they, they control the temperature and the sound. They control oxygen levels to make sure you have enough oxygen to think well. It wasn't until I started working home that I had any idea there were so many leaf blowers in the world and so much background noise and construction. And when space went away, all of these things became challenges. All of these boundaries we had been relying on went away and we had to rely on digital technology to substitute for what we had been relying on space for. We're really lucky that the technology was where it was. We're really lucky, for example, um, the, that the web had several decades of bringing about the changes that we've talked about. Because can you imagine if this had happened back in 1994 when the first web conference was happening? It couldn't have. It required those changes to happen. And I think when you look at the context of sort of the history of the geography of work, it really puts what's currently happening into context. So prior to the pandemic, you can argue that the, in, at least in the United States, there um, had been roughly five eras in the history of the geography of work. There was the uh, industrial revolution era, prior to which we all worked from home. Like working from home was sort of the standard forever. <laughs> it was only then that we shifted to going elsewhere to work. There was the industrial revolution era. There was a skyscraper era where we were able to create additional density. The suburb era where people moved out of cities and then commuted into work. The edge city era, which is actually when Microsoft came into existence, Redmond being Redmond, Washington being an edge city. Uh, and the most recent one, the superstar city era, where companies like Amazon uh, came into existence. And new technologies were often what drove the transition between these different eras. So for example, steel frame construction helped bring about the skyscraper era and democratized access to cars enabled people to commute to work in the suburbs era. And there is good evidence now that we're beginning to start a sixth era, the hybrid work era. And it's digital technology and the web that is gonna shape the hybrid work era. And that makes our jobs exciting. We get to define this era. And it is, our responsibility to do this thoughtfully, given the externalities that we know ex exist. You know, prior to the pandemic, the ability to collect and analyze and use data at scale, it was already transforming work. And then the pandemic significantly accelerated that transformation and more work is digitally mediated than ever. And the need for digital mediation to be valuable is more important than ever. And I really wanna put a call out to action to this community to think about the, how the work you do applies broadly to the significant disruption to work practices that we're all living through right now. Um, I have a few research areas that I think are important to dive into, but I think it would be fun to also brainstorm other things that, that are important. I mean, I think this is, this is a research agenda that we need to define. You know, one of the things that I think we really need to lean into is goal-directed AI. How do we start looking at driving these feedback cycles by things other than engagement? 
And that requires a lot of thinking, uh, you know, from the technical, technical things of how do we incorporate goals? How do we capture and measure them? Um, you know, what are the business models? How do we incent them? How do we make that happen? Um, I think there's a ton that's going to happen around new collaboration models. There's all sorts of interesting work happening in the HCOMP community and other areas where we think about how, um, how people work, especially when together, especially when unconstrained by geolocation. Um, there's all sorts of things that we're going to need to be doing around uh, privacy preserving machine learning, employee centered privacy, thinking about these, uh, and we should have been doing this before, but I feel like really thinking that, and we have been doing some, but like it really need to be thinking about what are the implications of this data? How do we, how do we aggregate data for AI and analytics in a way that um, respects people's uh, ownership of data and helps, helps them capture value from it while not leaking information that they don't want to. Um, we're also starting to see a real resurgence of the personal information management community. And actually the PIM community has recently even started doing regular meetings together. And I think we're gonna start seeing a, um, a real increased interest on um, work and, and uh, how, how our tools can help us in organizational context and work context. Um, and so I think we've got a lot of fun work and important work ahead of us. And it was a pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, this, was, this was inspiring. And um, while you were talking, Raphael, our lovely general chair was telling me off for not having the branded background, which I cannot have because <laughs> I seem to have a problem with my computer and that, that, that this allows me to do that. But I've also read that one of the things we've uh, done during the pandemic is just connect to each other more personally. And we see, I, I think it was a Microsoft study, right? Where we um, uh, seen that people all of a sudden know more about uh, each other's lives. So web community, there you go, that's my wall. Those are some of the paintings that I have, uh, that I have done myself. And with that, we complete the self-advertising and move into the questions. <laughs> um, point though to remember, I don't know if you all remember, there was this pre-pandemic, there was this viral video where somebody was on a call and like yes. their kids came running yes. into the room and we're like, oh, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> like none of us would find that shocking anymore. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't have a kid or a dog running around, so that's not gonna happen today. Um, so there's a few things that I've been meaning to ask you actually ever since um, I, I heard your, your talk in, in November last year. Um, one was um, about, so one thing that, that I sort of missed during the pandemic was my commute. Um, because I had a certain ritual. So there were certain things that I would do during the commute that would make me prepare mentally and otherwise for, for my work day and certain things when I when I got back home, right? Um, so that disappeared. And I was wondering if um, you found any data or if you worked on this in, in, in any way, if you have any thoughts about, about what to do with the commute in a, in a world where we go to the office perhaps only two days a week instead of five. Elena, I couldn't have paid you to ask a better question because that's actually something that I have a bunch of passion about. Okay. <laughs> and um, is a, an amazing example I mentioned earlier about how research is showing up in product faster than ever. And it's actually an amazing example of that. So I was really interested in commute um, even prior to the pandemic and the value that it provides. And uh, Shamsi Iqbal and Alex Williams and I did uh, some research in this space. And, and I think it was partly inspired. So I've got four kids and not quite long enough a commute for it to be as valuable as I would like it to be when I'm headed home from the office. So I'd head home from the office and you've got everything kind of running in your head and you need some time. And I'd show up at home and you walk in the door and all of a sudden I've got four kids being like, mom, what's for dinner? And so-and-so pulled my hair and this is broken or whatever. Um, and I would yell at my kids and it was terrible. Like I, I still yell at them anyway, but like I mean, more so than I should have. And, and, um, uh, I, and, and then exactly as you said, when the pandemic hit, it got even worse because what I, all I would do was like open the door to this room and walk out and get that. 
and, and it was hard. Um, we ran a study we, we developed called SwitchBot, actually thinking very intentionally about how you help somebody transition away from work at the end of the day and then in the morning back onto work. And so it was a chat bot that looks at this. I think there's, um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we found with SwitchBot that I think is interesting and valuable and that we should all take to heart is so first of all, switch bot at the end of the day, kind of talking through your goal. And it was particularly useful, not so, like a little bit of like, sometimes you have to kind of like get down tasks and more, but what about just talking about your goals? What were your goals? What are your goals? How are you going to achieve them? How are you going to achieve those goals is, is valuable. And doing that at the end of the day would help people let go of work and do less work in the evening, send fewer emails. Um, and the interesting thing was that then positively impacted their productivity the next day. So they were actually more productive when they got back into the office. So it's one of those lovely cases where it's a win-win and we can, we can, we should both let go of work and we will be even better workers, even, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so one of the things that happens, we actually took that switch bot research and built it into Teams after the pandemic hit. And so there's now functionality within Teams called virtual commute which helps you transition at the right, right. end of the day. Just one of the things that makes Teams mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I also think Teams is amazing. Uh, one of the things I really like about Teams is its um, relationship between synchronous and asynchronous engagement. And that's an area where I think we all should be leaning in to more in the future. What does it, what, how do we transition between face-to-face -face conversation and, mm -hmm. uh, and other kinds of communication and content creation? Okay, I have another question from you from the audience. Um, let's see, how is Web 3.0? I'm not sure if it's 3.0 or if it's Web 3, um, but how is this new web going to shape our work um, from, from, from home? So let's just think about Web 3 perhaps, because that's a, a technology that, some people present as an iteration of the, of the current web. Yeah, um, it is, and, and I, I don't know yet. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. I don't know, it's something that I'm watching and paying attention to. And I certainly think, I mean, I would say as, as members of the web conference community, the World Wide Web community, I think we're all believers in decentralization, we're all believers in um, the ability to share information, especially in ways that are, you know, secure and reliable. And so those things I think will be important moving forward. The specific technologies that are getting implemented and, and where they're going, I am not sure yet. I do think there's a bunch of interesting research to happen in as I mentioned sort of at the end of my talk around um, cryptography, uh, privacy, security, that's going to be in, important for us to think about in the context of work. But I don't, I don't, th I don't think that fully addresses the question. So um, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Yes, then. To be continued next time. <laughs> All right. I see another question from from Slack, from which we're using for our organization committee um, dis discussions, um, and it's about um, nonverbal communication. Um, so we have tons of research about how this works in um, physical setting. We've been trained. In fact, yesterday I was in a in a workshop to training people with, uh, to do public speaking and we tell people to do certain things um now we can just forget about all that right so um it's it's, it's very very different is your team looking at that do you have any sort of insights for for us into how that affects productivity uh, so so non-verbal language in a in a remote setting that is yeah um not Nonverbal communication is very important for one of the things that's hardest in a remote setting, which is turn taking. And so I know we often think in the context of turn taking that lag and that sort of thing is hard and certainly lag 
creates issues. But one of the things that's really hard about turn picking is actually, especially when you're talking in a group. So if, if I'm in a group with a bunch of people, I do all sorts of nonverbal cues. Like when I'm done talking, I'll go face the person I expect to talk next. And now that's that's very hard to do this. So there's all sorts of ways um, that is leaning in there. We're learning different skills. So as you said, it was a lifetime of skills that we learned the physical face-to-face -face interactions. It's interesting to me. When I first started presenting online, for example, too, I tried to do it like I would do if I was standing on a stage and I found myself moving back and forth and it didn't work as well. I've learned to stay, stay still, move less. Um, fascinating as we head back into the real world mm -hmm. that those things are kind of hard to reintroduce mm -hmm. to. Um, I, uh, especially actually like hybrid, I want to, I guess I want to put a call out to everybody to be really patient with hybrid too. Cause one of the things that I've gotten used to like now, the thing that people invested, people didn't surprisingly did not invest in their home offices very much. Like we didn't actually buy all that much stuff. The thing that we invested in were good cameras and a nice background because <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I'm well set up at home now that I've got a nice camera. It's, it's positioned well. Um, it, it looks nice. I go into the office and I try and join a meeting, uh, you know, to participate in a hybrid manner. I join from my computer and not and like everybody's looking at me. I'm like, this is not the angle that I intended the world to see me at. And um, so I think we've got, we're, we've got a whole bunch of different things. I think we're going to be bringing some of this nonverbal kinds of engagement into the remote setting, the biggest one, and this is um, is it, 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 that that we'll start seeing more of a spatial audio and just that ability to start placing things and use um, it's that's technically verbal, I guess, but I think that's going to be a new cue that we don't currently have that will come in. Uh -huh. um, and then, but there's also a lot that like the, the answer isn't remote. I think the answer is hybrid and, and having, you know, there's lots of things that remote is good for, and there's lots of things that are really good for in-person at the moment, at, at least that you should be leaning into doing new things, brainstorming, meeting somebody for the first time. You know, these are things that you want to be uh, debating, having a hard conversation. Those are good things that are good for remote. This uh, presentation is pretty good for remote and you get to chat and you get to there's all sorts of other things that are that are benefiting for that but so we do want to be thinking intentionally in places where those cues that we don't yet have built in mm -hmm. like we should we should be recognizing that and leaning into that as well i have a question i think it's going to be the final question for this for this session from yoel marek of, of amazon oh. don't you see a risk that the tech people can work in a hybrid mode um, will further separate from the workforce that can't. Could it? Could that create a? Do you pronounce it chasm? So I think it's a gap, um, right? Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, between different types of of populations, say tech people or tech savvy people and others. Um, it's a great question, a really important one, and one that we're thinking a lot about at Microsoft. Um, uh, in part, actually, because like the digital transformation that tech workers have undergone is huge, and the, the real opportunity for growth and doing new things is in other is in other places. Eighty percent of the world's workforce is not sort of traditional uh, information workers that, it, that we think of that you know that Teams or Zoom or something like that support. One of the really fascinating things, however is how much work that we didn't traditionally think of as information work has become information work. And, and I think it speaks to the opportunity ahead. Um, so in the US, for example, a third of people uh, were able to switch from working in person to working remote pretty much overnight in March. About a third of people were furloughed and couldn't work and then about a third were deemed essential and continued to go into the office. Um, and one of the things that you see was some of that essential actually ended up starting transitioning a little bit over time too. Um, so I now do my exercise classes remotely. I meet with a doctor remotely. This was work that didn't actually happen remotely. In some ways, it's also helping us understand what parts of information work aren't information work, like sitting around whiteboarding and thinking about things like that's not actually maybe, you know, it's something that we can do remotely. That's something that we have to do together. That's an interaction you know, that requires co-presence. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity there, but the, 
The digital transformation that happened is not just for tech workers. It is truly happening. I mean, we see this even just in factory floors. So we like increasingly, like you couldn't get people into factories to fix machines. And so you start wearing head mounted displays and HoloLens is using that to like, you know, for a technician to guide somebody through fixing a machine. Uh, and, and that's a pretty amazing opportunity ahead of us. That, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. And you've all heard the call for action. Um, everyone in the audience, don't leave because uh, we are now going to go straight into the closing ceremony, which will include the best paper awards. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.